Jose Andres, welcome to Meet the Press. Thank you for doing this interview. Thank you for having me. Well, we're honored that you can be here. Your organization, World Central Kitchen, has been on the ground in Gaza for many months now, and your new effort is to get food and to get other aid um, via Cyprus by sea. As we sit here today, the boats have left Cyprus. What is the very latest on your effort to get food and aid into Gaza? Well, we, we've been trying to bring the hype down uh, from the beginning because this is a highly complex situation. But right now, yes, we have um, a boat with a barge with almost 200 tons of food that we're doing this pilot because it's the first time that anybody is going to be trying to arrive to the shores of Gaza in years because it's been a Navy blockade uh, of Gaza. So that alone is just an amazing achievement that we are already with permission by everybody involved sailing towards, uh, towards Gaza. Uh, we are still a few days away because it moves slow for different reasons and because we are still handling the most difficult part, which is in the middle of nowhere, uh, building a jetty with machinery that is the machinery we have in Gaza with no option to bring any new machinery inside with concrete and rubble that comes from the destruction of this situation. And what we are trying to build a 60 to 70 meter jetty into the sea that will give us the option to safely download the first cargo. And from that jetty, you just built a bigger one that will allow us to hopefully bring more and more boats, bigger and bigger quantities. So we are moving into Gaza, but still at the same time, we are trying to finish the impossible, which is this jetty that will allow us to download the first cargo right now in the early days of Ramadan. And what are the challenges of such an extraordinary effort, including building your own jetty? How do you actually get the food and aid to the people once the boats arrive? Well, the same way we've been doing it all these uh, many, many weeks and months, uh, the idea uh, of coming by the sea, uh, or obviously was because the need in the north. We were having, everybody was having a big difficulty achieving uh, delivering food in the north. The north is the reason we began many weeks ago with this great idea of let's go to, to Gaza by boat, uh, because the north needs all the help they, they can get. That's why we began doing uh, in partnership, obviously, leadership of the Jordanian government and the king of Jordan. I've been in those planes where very much um, we really push for can we do airdrops in quantity in the north. Uh, king Abdullah was doing already trips to fulfill the needs of the Jordanian uh, hospital. Uh, but uh, if he was being successful, why we didn't do it in a more massive way. And that's when we began with four more planes, then seven more planes, then other countries began joining. And I don't know right now the exact number, but hundreds of thousands, if not millions of meals ready to eat. They've been distributed in the north that I know has had some criticism, but quite frankly, I don't understand why. It's people going hungry and starving, especially children. Any food we could be putting in the north uh, was worth the effort because those military planes are sitting in the countries doing absolutely nothing. So why not to put them at the service of relieving some of the pain that those people are going in the north? Uh, I'm very proud that that happened, and I'm very proud Wilson Dragician, in a way, has been there uh, next to the King of Jordan and, and following his leadership in something like was necessary. The same we're doing with the boat. More is more. Of course we should be bringing humanitarian aid by road. Of course by now we should be having at least two, three other entry points into Gaza. Of course, but I cannot, we cannot control any of those situations. But what we can control is 
trying to find other ways to bring the humanitarian aid. How many people will be fed with this latest shipment that it's on its way now to Gaza? Again, the, the quantity of people with this shipment will be, you know, 100, 200,000 meals. But again, uh, <laughs> uh, we have to start. The important now was not how many meals we bring, how many tons of lentils and rice we bring. Uh, the important now was to break down the code in how to arrive to Gaza. It's, uh, uh, it's what I've been doing in Cyprus. Why I was in Cyprus for a week. Why I was in Tel Aviv for a week. Why I was in Amman. Why I, uh, well, because we had to be moving and talking to the people that could give us the green light to make something like this possible. Talking to the Mukhtar, the elders in Palestine, getting the permission of the Palestinian Authority, getting the permission of uh, Gaza City Mayor, uh, getting the permission of COGAT, the humanitarian arm of uh, IDF, uh, getting the permission of everybody, because if no, there's no way we can dream to, to get to the shores. Uh, uh, but then with all these permissions, then we, where there is a will, there is a way. Still, it's a lot of things that can go wrong, from the seas changing, the weather changing, uh, finding difficulties in the construction of the jetty. But again, uh, still failure is a possibility. But what we cannot do is use fail the people of Gaza. That will be the true failure is not trying. So we're trying, and I hope that in a few days we can say we've had little success, and from that success, everybody being comfortable that this is possible, we can build uh, a bigger system to bring huge quantities of food daily into the shores of Gaza. And just to follow up on that point, as of right now, to the best of your knowledge, these ships that have departed, there has been no issue with them uh, getting to Gaza. I mean, I've had many nights of no sleep uh, uh, around... Uh, uh, 8, uh, 8.05 a.m. Uh, Cyprus time, around uh, 2, 3 a.m. Uh, American time, uh, the boat uh, left uh, Larnaca. Uh, and so far, we, we are heading slowly, but heading. Uh, it's a barge at this moment, because the barge gives us a lot of ability to adapt to the circumstances. Uh, the beaches of Gaza, and specifically the place we've been given permission to build the jetty, uh, is not perfect place, but we work through imperfections. Um, we need to make sure that we have at least two, three meters, that that barge can really have a possibility to connect with the jetty, and that's why we are still finalizing the 60 to 70 meter jetty into the sea. But again, there are challenges of different, different types. What's the biggest risk with this type of a mission? Well, uh, obviously the risk is that the weather changes overnight. To have a barge going from Cyprus to Gaza itself is crazy. Uh, we could be bringing a bigger, bigger boat uh, initially, but we felt like that was not the best way to begin. So, you know, going uh, for many miles, uh, nautic miles, in the middle of the ocean with a barge attached to a slightly bigger uh, boat. That itself, it's uh, risky enough. Um, but we've done things like this in the past, and at this moment, it's the only way we had. I wish I could be using a port closer from Israel or a port closer from Egypt, but that's not possible. The one I have is Cyprus, so we don't complain. We try. Uh, and the weather can change overnight. We see how the sea is. We have a, a window. We have a window that we are using. Uh, um, if this window closes, we may have to go back. Uh, the jetty needs to be finished. It's certain things that we don't know. As we build, challenges show up, and we try used to overcome those challenges. But so far, uh, so good. Uh, communications uh, is not so easy to, to be communicating in between the teams. Communications in the place we are, inside Gaza, uh, still, it's, it's, it's a challenge, and the person leaving the, the building uh, of the Yeti, uh, you know, sometimes we're all day waiting until he gets access to a Wi-Fi sign a signal that can communicate what's happening and what's right and what's wrong and what other aid he may need. 
it's, 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 it's different issues that some are diplomatic, some are technical, uh, and sometimes they all happen at once. So we, we keep going and as we, we don't write the plan, we adapt. As we move forward, the plan writes itself. It strikes me that you are building a jetty. The United States is planning to build a port that it says will take 60 days. How is it that you were able to build a jetty, which is still in progress, before the U.S. government? And, and should Israel be doing more here? Well, obviously the, the size of the port that, for the little information we have, that the U.S. government through the U.S. military is building. It's a, uh, it's a beautiful one and will have enough power and size to be used to be able to channel huge quantities of food. Mm -hmm. That port itself could be handling so much in, in, in huge ways. So I'm very, very happy that obviously the U.S. Uh, is taking this uh, uh, leadership mission with many other countries around the world already supporting and joining the efforts uh, of, of the uh, U.S. But we are in the early days of Ramadan. Um, we understand the importance that Ramadan has for the Muslim world. And that's why for us it was very important that in a moment that millions of, of Muslims uh, are celebrating Ramadan, uh, that we were doing the biggest effort to, in this very difficult situation, to, to show some some good news, that is that we can bring more food so the people of Gaza uh, are fed and no children will be uh, uh, left hungry. It's been many experts, I'm no expert, and many leaders of big uh, NGOs uh, making obvious the, their dissatisfaction. Uh, uh, I think was an effort that was worth trying. I think it's an effort that is worth keeping until we don't have a way to bring big quantities of food into the north of Gaza. Anything we do is not enough. The leadership of King Abdullah was the one that made that happen. I was in plane with him delivering food into Gaza. Things happen, malfunctions happen. It was unbelievably unfortunate that those um, uh, planes were some mar parachutes uh, malfunction or the calculations of the load that those parachutes could handle was not done in the right way. What I can tell you uh, that King Abdullah, we tested his parachutes in the open desert in Jordan a few times. I have the videos on my phone and this was Success. It didn't happen. Let's go to throw parachutes. It was a lot of thinking and planning by the Jordanian Air Force. Uh, and that's why they began doing. We began doing four. World Central Kitchen has been uh, putting food for the last few days that we have a big uh, warehouse with meals ready to eat. That this is some of the food that also uh, the Jordanian Air Force has been dropping. So we've been uh, very happy that we've been partnering with them now for quiet sometimes. And they've been giving us a lot of help and logistics. But yes, I'm very happy that the uh, U.S. military uh, decided to join the efforts that began with the King of Jordan. Uh, I would say more at this point is highly necessary because the people of the northern Gaza are in need of food. Therefore, I don't understand the criticisms. Offshore, we should be bringing more trucks. Offshore, we should be um, opening new entry points around Israel. Yes, offshore, offshore, that's very beautiful. But if the powers to be are not able to do this, we need to be finding uh, other ways. And just to end, yes, five people died, and that was very unfortunate uh, by the, 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 the one or two uh, countries, which was not United States and was not Jordan, uh, as far as I know. Uh, but uh, we need to remember that there's been also humanitarian missions with trucks that they've run over children and families when the drivers, nervous because the situation, press the gas mm. and run out over people. What I mean is parachutes uh, were not the only way that delivering food people have perished. Has been people also perish by trucks that trying to do the right thing because the situation is so tense, people die under the wheels of those trucks or even some of the 
people guarding some of those trucks that were no Hamas, were Palestinian police, that sometimes they shoot at the crowds to try to keep it organized. I was there. Uh, I saw it. Uh, they are good people, but that they were trying to control the crowds. Some shots were done, and some shots probably hit people. What I mean is also what's going on the land has created unfortunate situations. It's a very challenging area where to work, and nobody should be dying, especially nobody should be dying in the process of delivering food, but the situation sometimes creates chaos. And, and just, I mean, sh given everything you're saying, do you want the Israeli government to do more, to do more to work with the United States to help them, to help you in your efforts try to get food and aid to the people who are suffering in Gaza? Well, I mean, uh, nothing goes in without permission of Israel. And Kogat is the humanitarian arm. And uh, my experience working with the men of Kogat is that they are doing everything at their disposal to help the people of Gaza. But they, 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 they have their hands handcuffed too because that's a military operation and uh, Kogat can only do what they are also allowed to do. Um, should Israel be doing more? Uh, totally. Uh, ceasefire should be happening immediately. The hostages should be released totally. What is a little bit difficult to understand is how you are doing a mission to try to liberate your fellow citizens, but you are bombing at times, building after building, that you may have those hostages right in those buildings. So if the true intention of that is releasing the hostages, I will not say this is the most clever way to try to take them out alive. Um, at the same time, uh, I would say uh, peace should win the day. I do believe uh, the future of the Middle East and the future of Israel is when the people of Gaza and the people of Palestine thrive too. If everybody thrives, peace can be achieved much more easily. Uh, and this situation seems that is just putting that possible peace between Israel and Palestinians further and further in the horizon. So let's hope the ceasefire happens. Let's hope that the, the, the hostages are released. Let's hope that also uh, Palestinians that they are in Israeli jail sometimes by throwing rocks are also uh, released. Let's hope that everybody stops hitting at each other with missiles and rockets and where no civilians die. Uh, at the end, uh, Israel has in their power uh, at the very least, if they don't stop the, the, the military advance, to make sure that nobody is hungry and that nobody is without food and water. This is something that should be happening overnight. But for political reasons, I guess, it's not happening yet. Let's talk about the history of World Central Kitchen, the first major conflict zone war that you went into was in Ukraine. What was that like and how did it prepare you for the work that you're doing now in Gaza? Well, I, I think you're never prepared. Uh, the more I know, the more I know nothing. Uh, with boots on the ground is when life shows you experience. Many of the things was into a kitchen we've ever done. It's not like we have a manual. Uh, you learn as you go. Uh, uh, we were on the first day of the liberation of Butch and Irpin. We saw the atrocities that the Russian military did to those men and women with people uh, on the ground with a shot in their head with a piece of bread next to their hand uh, just for going out and trying to bring better bread to feed their children, people were being shot. Um, we were the first day of the liberation of Kherson where we created a, a system of bringing water to the entire city with multiple water distribution points and multiple food distribution points trying to bring food to everybody in a city that had no food because the Russians took it all with them. Um, we lost people. We got bakeries bombed, kitchens bombed, and we lost uh, six people uh, in three different bombings uh, in the places they were sleeping, that even they were in a bunker when uh, the missile just gets on top. Uh, sometimes there's not much you can do. So this gave me 
an understanding and a feeling I never had before. Uh, we go to volcanoes and we put ourselves sometimes in difficult situations when you have to bring food to thousand elderly men and women near the top of the volcano. You argue, and, and why are not they living? Life is complicated. When they are very old and you don't even have roads, they rather prefer to stay where they are. It's risk in going near the top of a volcano. It's risky to go in the middle of an earthquake where uh, destruction is uh, all around you and you are even uh, not sure what buildings you can use or if you want to use a, any building or if a building is going to fall over you using the place you are trying to feed somebody. It's risk in all these situations, but the experience keeps making you aware of them. Uh, we keep planning to make sure that everybody uh, obviously is safe uh, uh, at all times. But yes, Ukraine, for me, as a person, for World Central Kitchen as an organization, was a very important moment in our history because it was technically the first place that was a conflict. And we began without thinking, but we knew that the people of Ukraine needed help, and we began doing what we do, which is feeding the people that need food. Are you worried that the world is starting to forget about what's happening in Ukraine, what is still happening in Ukraine, as there's so much focus, rightfully so, on the war in the Middle East now? Um, obviously, Ukraine has been uh, forgotten, and this conflict um, has made even that uh, even worse. Uh, Ukraine is a country that is defending itself. I'm not a man of war, I'm a man of peace. Um, but they are defending their land. If they don't defend the land, they have no land left. Uh, so it's very different when you attack them, when you are defending yourself. So I do believe the United States should be far away more. Uh, Europe should be doing far away more. We are letting these people that they've shown they know how to defend themselves, almost like alone and forgotten. Um, I do believe that if we don't stand to leaders that want to bring mayhem and chaos to the world. Uh, the world is not a better place. We saw it, what happened at the beginning of World War II. It was one person that looked uh, inoffensive and everybody was kind of diminishing his intentions. Well, uh, when somebody is going to tell you that they are going to be doing something wrong, believe them. Uh, Putin's intentions are very clear. Uh, we need to believe what he says. Uh, America and Europe should be doing far away more to Ukraine. It's not only at stake the freedom and democracy of uh, Ukraine, but the freedom and democracy of Europe, but the freedom and democracy of the world. Ukrainians are fighting for values, and in the process, indirectly, Ukraine feeds 400 million people every year with the grain that comes from their very fertile land. In a way, they are also fighting to keep feeding the world. Uh, is many things at play in Ukraine, and I hope uh, we will keep giving the support they deserve. How do you find people who are able to put fear aside and go into these conflict zones, these war zones, to provide food and aid to other people? Well, we, we don't push anybody um, to go. At the very beginning of Ukraine, Bolsandra Kitchen, uh, only was one or two people inside. The bus operation was outside in Poland. Do but you ever get afraid? Are you oh, ever afraid? I, 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 I don't think... Uh, you are always afraid. Uh, but you are next to people that support each other, and even if we are all afraid, what are you going to do? Um, by being conscious, almost is like it disappears. Um, we have people that every day they are delivering food uh, to elderly fairly close to the front lines uh, and I'm afraid for them and I'm am amazed how brave uh, they are and we have a lot of women in our in our teams in Ukraine because um, vast majority of the men are uh, serving in the war in different uh, roles um, I've been many, many days in Ukraine. I think I've been more than 120, 130 days uh, in Ukraine. I've been around Ukraine a few times. I've been, as I told you before, in, in, in hard situations, in, 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 in landmine situations, in shooting situations, in, my God, what was that? A missile situation, a drone situation. 
But the people who are doing it are Ukrainians. They are the ones that they know that's what they have to do. And these Ukrainians that look at this as this is their life commitment to make sure that, obviously, they can look at the future, we hope, pushing the Russian troops away. And everybody does it the way they know best. In the case of Bolsendra Kitchen, it's just making sure that nobody uh, will be without uh, food and water in a very complicated steel situation today in the front lines. I'd like to talk to you about your journey as a chef. We are sitting here in your beautiful restaurant, Zetinia, which is marking its 20th anniversary. Congratulations. Why did you want to become a chef? How did you know? I don't even know if I'm a chef. I don't, I'm not very good running kitchens. And I think the word chef is not somebody that is only very talented culinarily, but somebody that also maybe uh, is good in the business side and the organizational side. And me, I think I am one of the best cooks in the planet. Uh, if I'm in front of a stove on these two hands, uh, the dish I'm going to make for you is not going to be one better. I don't mind to be a little bit pretentious saying it. Even my daughters will highly disagree with me. <laughs> they often complain. Yeah. Um, your daughters complain <laughs> about your cooking? Oh, yeah. They're, Daddy, this tortilla today was not as good as <laughs> the one that your friend makes. I'm like, really? Are they the only like, ones who complain uh, about your cooking? Oh, no, I've I never have, heard oh, anyone no, complain have, about your I cooking. Have, I have plenty, especially a few British <laughs> around me. Um, but, you know, my journey, I think, uh, the more I know, the more I know, I know nothing, especially in cooking and in food, and especially if you start reading books or traveling the world, <laughs> it's never ending. Uh, you can be 100 lifetimes trying to learn about ingredients and techniques and dishes and the stories and the people behind, and you don't have enough time. And this is the fascinating world I live in, that, my God, you can explain the history of the world through food. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, I say I'm not a cook, I'm not a chef, I'm a storyteller. I don't write, I don't paint, I don't sing. Uh, I express myself, like many people in my profession, through our, our food. One plate at a time, we tell a story. And that's what I built. Uh, I don't build businesses that hopefully make money and hopefully give the return back to the investors that believe and hopefully that return back the money to the investors that uh, uh, supported the, the business. But at the end, I'm a storyteller. And the people that I work with, in a way, they are storytellers. Uh, one plate at a time, you can be telling the story of the people of a particular country, or if it's not an ethnic restaurant, use whatever are the beliefs of the chef that is creating this creative menu for you. Uh, food. It's a great way to express who you are. When you first went to culinary school at the age of 15, I believe, could you have envisioned what your life has become, that you are doing humanitarian work as well as creating these beautiful spaces for people to enjoy food together? Uh, well, in a way, I'm kind of a dreamer, and I like to dream in the open, almost like a way to sharing what you hope for. Uh, with others is a way to pressure yourself to. But you know, my mom was a nurse, my father was a nurse. Um, mm. I think very early in my life, uh, I saw the commitment that those men and women, when well, the days I will visit the hospital where they work, that I don't know. Well, it was fascinating to see that everybody seems always to do the extra mile to help somebody. Beyond the, what their duties were, they will be reading a book to a child. Um, taking an elderly woman for a walk around, even beyond uh, their work uh, hours. Uh, and I always saw that as, wow, people are good people. We saw it during the pandemic, that the unsung heroes of this pandemic was those men and women that gave their lives and put even their families in danger, used to try to take care of every one of us in America and, uh, and around the world. So I think that early understanding that everybody had the talent, whatever the profession was, to do a little bit more uh, is what I saw by watching my mom and my dad working in this hospital outside Barcelona where all our friends were nurses and doctors. 
And that, to me, I think this had a very early, good, powerful uh, impact in my life. You talk about the importance, not just of bringing food, but the type of food that you are bringing. And, and I'm thinking specifically of your initial response to the earthquake in Haiti in 2010. And you wanted to bring food that had meaning to the people who live there. Why is that so important? Yeah, listen, in an emergency, in the first day, I will bring anything I can get my hands on to start feeding people. There's nothing wrong with a great hot dog if the hot dog is what allows you to do the most uh, tomorrow mm -hmm. uh, without thinking. Uh, so whatever we have, that's what we're going to use. But uh, when experience tells you that when you are um, in these emergencies, what usually is available are the ingredients that are the ones that people use to make the local dishes that people love. So are we going to be in New Orleans and we're going to be feeding people jambalaya because it's this company that has huge quantities of beautiful pre-made uh, jambalaya in the freezer? Oh, yeah, we're buying hundreds of thousands of those portions. And why we have jambalaya in New Orleans? Because that's what the people there, that's what we're going to be finding. If you are in Haiti, you're going to be finding uh, Pua Congo, which is this amazing bean that when it's in season, people are celebrating, they're making a stews. That's what people love. But also, that's what you have available. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Walls and Dragichen has always been in a very pragmatic way. Sure, we make ourselves proud that we feed the people what people want. But it's also the easiest thing to do because the people you use are local. The locals know how to cook the local foods. And usually the ingredients you have at your disposal are also the ingredients that people love. So again, yes, we do it, and we are very proud of that. But that's the easiest way forward. That's why we don't complicate our lives. And your new cookbook, named after this restaurant, Zaytinia, focuses on Mediterranean food. Talk about the significance of that and what you hope people will take from this new cookbook that you have. Well, uh, listen, um, you know, especially we're connected to what's happening in the Middle East now. Um, everybody has a huge love for food, especially now in Ramadan, the, mm -hmm. the, the family is coming together uh, to, to break fast and, and being a very important moment. But the time I spent in Israel and the time I've been uh, spending in, in, in Gaza, uh, seems everybody loves falafel and everybody loves hummus with equal intensity. How much you wonder how, how people that love the same foods, uh, they can be at odds with each other. Uh, right here in this restaurant, I have longer tables. When you bring people together around a table with the foods they love, that's a beautiful, powerful moment. Uh, I, w I wish my words were not used romantic words that everybody will agree with. And that food could be an amazing, powerful medium, medium used to bring uh, people together. But, but it is true. Uh, uh, Saitinia celebrates uh, uh, hundreds, if not thousands of years of, of traditions and dishes uh, with different cultures that everybody has added their touch that makes the, the uh, Mediterranean uh, cooking in the East Fascinating, same ingredients as where I grew up in Spain, but you learn that same ingredients in the hands and the traditions of others create things that are unbelievably different. Uh, we love chickpeas where I was born and where I grew up in Spain, but the way they treat chickpeas in uh, Lebanon or, or, or Greece or Turkey is so different. And this is the fascinating uh, work and Saitini obviously was uh, uh, a good story. I had a Spanish restaurant with the tapas. Tapas was very successful. You share. Um, well, uh, Greece, Turkey, Lebanon, Messe, they share. Was a very logical uh, thing for me to try. And I'm very happy 20 years later. Uh, I know a little bit uh, about the history of Greece and Turkey and Lebanon because I spent a lot of time traveling and researching. Uh, again, I don't open businesses. I tell the stories here. I've been trying to tell the story 
of, of the people of this fascinating part of the world. And just finally, given that you are immersed in all of this difficult work and all of these places that are experiencing so much pain and violence right now, what gives you hope and optimism? Listen, the hope and optimism I have is that when, when the early days, uh, on the first day uh, of the brutal attack against uh, different Israeli communities, uh, Wilson Dagitian began feeling right there. And with the help of, of locals, uh, not only Israeli, but other nationalities, no other Jewish, but other people from other religions, they all coming together to help us bring food and relief to those people that were decimated on that brutal attack. At the same time, so there I saw people helping people. The best humanity in the worst moments of humanity. It's the same thing we began doing right there also in Gaza. Uh, the situation was obviously getting complicated. We already had experience in Gaza a few years before. We went in next to our partner, Anera, a uh, long-time NGO, and we began opening uh, kitchens and start feeding people, all the way to 350,000 meals a day, and hopefully reaching half a million. And there I saw in the worst moments of humanity, people coming together, used to help their fellow um, citizens. And what I saw is breaking bread and having dinner is that even people on both sides that lost members. I didn't sense or got hate towards the others. Actually, it was the contrary. It's like, you know, I wish for them what I wish for mine. They, they should stop bombing us. But, but everybody will say the same words. They will say phrases that if you don't know who told you, you will be confused. But that both phrases apply to both people. Everybody wishes the best for their people. You say everybody should be living a prosperous life with hope. That should apply for Israelis, but should apply for Palestinians too. And everybody agrees. Everybody should have access to food and water. Nobody disagrees, but actually everybody agrees. Nobody should be dying under weapons. Obviously what is happening in Gaza is just terrible. And civilians, children, women should not be dying anymore. But it's true that Israel also keeps being uh, attacked. So what is good for me must be good for others. No, body should be wishing bad to others. Breaking bread with people in Gaza and breaking bread with people in Israel, that's the feeling you get, that they don't wish the others anything wrong, that everybody wants peace and prosperity. What is good for me must be good for others. That's the feeling you get. That's the experience I get. We cannot let the voices on the streams that try to break us apart bring the wars in all of us. We need the voices of logic, pragmatism, and good be the voices that impose themselves. The streams are creating very terrible situations, not in the Middle East, but in many places in America and around the world. Let's break bread, especially during this Ramadan, be living in longer tables. What is good for me must be good for you. Because I do believe is what the vast majority of people want. We need to give those people the place at the table and their voices must be heard. Because it's more people of good than people of mayhem. Let's give the table to the people of goodness. We will end it on that very powerful note. Jose Andres, thank you so much. I hey, really appreciate this conversation. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.